Доброго вечора, ми з України. Я рада вітати наших глядачів в День Святого Валентина. І так, не безпокойтесь, Действительно, видео будет на английском языке, но у нас будут субтитры, поэтому вы сможете, если что, посмотреть, несмотря на то, насколько вы совершенно владеете английским языком. И сегодня у нас совершенно особенный день. У нас потрясающий гость, которого пригласил Гарри. Это видео будет, безусловно, размещено и на канале Гарри Юрий Табах. Ну и, естественно, на моем. И сейчас Гарри представит своего коллегу, своего друга. И я тоже очень горжусь, что на праздничный день сегодня у нас действительно праздничный эфир. Итак, Гарри, вам слово уже на английском. Спасибо, Мария. Thank you very much, Maria. Yes, happy Valentine's Day. I hope it will be happy for many people. But last year was this year. We can see that... Uh, It's not uh, so many young people are not very happy in Ukraine, but uh, and it's unfortunate that we will be talking on the Valentine's Day not about love but about war. And I want to introduce you uh, a very special man, a truly a very special man, a true American hero. Be honest with you, I'm a little bit jealous. I want this is the this is the guy I wanted to be, you know, all my life. This is this is the American hero I. To be, and it is a uh, major general uh, Mike Repass, uh, major general in Russia. I know there are going to be some smart people going to say, "Oh, major general, this the rank doesn't exist." And uh, yeah, it does. Believe me, it does. The only thing is, in Russian, it is a one-star general. In the United States, it's a two-star general, and a lieutenant general in Russia is a two-star. And in, in the United States, it's a three-star general. So major general in the United States is a little bit bigger general than in Russia. So uh, General uh, Repas graduated from a famous uh, military school. We call them academies, uh, Military Academy of West Point. Many people heard of it. This is this is where we actually make generals. I think at a very young age, and uh, not only did he graduate from uh, that famous uh, school and became a lieutenant, an officer of infantry, he and I am wearing uh, an, uh, an army tie in his honor. You, know, you can see the little soldiers there, and. Uh, He spent most of his career, you know, 30-year uh, lifetime career with a very famous, you know, the tip of the spear, 101st Air Assault Division with a, with a band of brothers, as uh, we know, as Screaming Eagles. There are many, many movies, many books are written about these brave men. And he was uh, a special forces guy, uh, with also we... We know of them, and let me just latest. You know, he started out from from a lieutenant to the major general, pretty much with the same outfit, and became a commander of Special Operations Command Europe and commanding general of the United States Army Special Forces Command and Special Operations Command in Europe. Uh, uh, he uh, his career took him to more places than it took me. He spent time in Grenada, and I guess that was Ortega time, sir? Am I correct? No, that was uh, that was a different, uh, Ortega was Panama, but uh, oh, Panama, it yeah. was a different band of stuff, the same theme. Grenada, I mean, there is a movie, uh, Rage Something with Clint Eastwood, and I don't know if anybody told you you look a little bit like Clint Eastwood. <laughs> so with the, with the Grenada, where with the Cubans were, with the with the with Egypt, NATO headquarters, Germany, uh, Okinawa, Japan, and of course in the Operation Iraqi Freedom, and uh, he has been uh, married uh, all his life, I guess, to uh, a lady called Linda, his wife, and they have one son. And now General is the chief executive officer of a Global Solutions, Able Global Solutions. And uh, uh, <clears throat> the General and I share uh, many friends together. I had an honor to serve under uh, also Major General Bernard Glefki, who mm -hmm. speaks Russian, Chinese, and seven other languages. And I have uh, uh, on target with Captain Tabak, 
a program where I'm interviewing General Lefty, who's a very, who's a legend, uh, I think, in uh, in our country. And uh, also, we just learned uh, that my former boss uh, also is a classmate <laughs> from West Point uh, of General Repass. Well, General, thank you so much for joining us because this is very important at this moment in history that somebody like you, uh, somebody who knows, I don't know anybody who would know more about special operations, special forces than you would, to join us, to join Maria and I, and we'll try to answer uh, some of the questions that we have. Uh, and I know Maria has, you know, as Angel as she looks, there is also a devil in her that she will ask very, <laughs> very tough questions. So, Maria, please, you have a first uh, frontal attack uh, on the general for whom I probably I feel sorry at this point. I will make a uh, short question, first of all, because uh, Gary presented you already. I don't want to uh, spend the time of our viewers. And thank you very much, Gary, for doing it so precisely. I want to thank you uh, for uh, for uh, sharing St. Valentine's Day with us. And my first question is, uh, from your opinion, um, what do you think generally about the military support of United States given to Ukraine? What do you think about it? Is it sufficient, insufficient, slow, quick? Can you give the characteristics? So my overall opinion is that uh, it's been somewhat robust. Uh, there are some areas that are clearly lacking, and uh, I've talked to many people about this, uh, where we could improve in two areas one in capabilities uh we could be more robust and certainly in timeliness uh, but the timeliness gets into some unique aspects that are ukrainian uh, and the ukrainians need to help us on that but uh let me go to the robustness first now, there are things that we aren't doing that we should do uh, and one of them is to help on the logistics side um, to provide more timely logistics. I, I suppose that, that a, a better way of doing business, and one that I'm very familiar with in more time, is a push system of logistics, where instead of waiting for a list of requirements to come out of Ukraine, uh, we know what the, the, uh, the armaments are in Ukraine, and we anticipate what the use rate is and what the repair rate should be. And we push the, that equipment, those supplies and repair parts to Ukraine on a push basis, rather than waiting for a number of weeks for our list to be consolidated, to get approved at the general staff and to come out to uh, the various nations for sourcing. Now, that's a very inefficient way of doing business. It also ensures that you're somewhere between eight and 12 weeks behind your actual requirements on the ground. So I think the U.S. and NATO need to help on the logistics side of the house uh, to fix that aspect of what's going on there. In terms of capabilities, uh, there are things that we aren't doing that we should do, uh, and, do and do more of. Uh, the first one is on the tank side. The, the tanks should have been fielded there uh, long before uh, they're going to be in place, which is another, into March is the earliest arrival of uh, the U.S. tanks as, as it is uh, currently forecasted. Uh, they probably should have been there at the end of uh, uh, November or early December, in my opinion, uh, if not sooner. Uh, the other thing that we're not providing, uh, we aren't providing, we are not providing uh, the ATACMS missiles, which have an extended range uh, much farther than the, uh, the current set of missiles that, that the United States and the West have provided uh, throughout uh, the conflict. Now, the United States is providing these medium-range missiles, these uh, small-diameter glide bombs, uh, 
uh, which are launched and uh, have a glide factor to them that extend their range out to uh, probably double of what we're seeing currently with the HIMARS. Uh, those will be useful, but uh, I don't think they pack the same punch that an ATACMS missile uh, would punch. So uh, with the ATACMS, you could range the Kurt Street Bridge. You could range the airfields in uh, in uh, Crimea. 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 Yeah, that would uh, that would eliminate that as a safe haven for the launch of the uh, the UAVs and the uh, Shahid drones that are pummeling the Ukrainian infrastructure, primarily the electric in infrastructure. So I think the ATACMS would be a much uh, needed, is, is a much needed capability uh, that they don't have and we haven't provided and don't intend to provide because it, it can range deeply into uh, Russia as well. Um, so that's, that's a problem. However, let me, let me say something. I, I, I saw your um, interesting video on Lynn Lease. Um, I, should, I should say that you have to be careful of what you ask for in that case, because what you have now is you have uh, overwhelming support in Congress for uh, supporting the war effort, essentially blank checks going to Ukraine. Uh, and that's bipartisan. If you go to a Lynn Lease situation, I think you will lose that bipartisan support. Because the politicians, as you, as you rightly noted, Maria, uh, there are other things that are hung on to that, that legislation. We call them Christmas ornaments. It's like you put an ornament on a tree. Your favorite ornament gets onto the tree into the front, or maybe you sneak it around to the back, but it's still onto the tree. And it gets funded, and it, take care, it takes care of their constituents. That moves the package along. When you take that away and go to strictly a lend lease program, then you will see a, a significant decline in uh, political support, particularly uh, bipartisan support for uh, supporting Ukraine. So I think you're in a good position right now. The mechanism is there. It's not everything that you want. It's certainly not everything that you need, um, but it's working sufficiently well, I would say. Uh, and there's a lot of room for improvement. So that's a long answer to your uh, very important question. But, sir, uh, well, why can't land lease work in parallel with other programs as well? Because with, with the money that's allocated in the other programs, it's just not enough to buy what's needed in Ukraine. I mean, we're just dishing out another almost half a billion dollars to build um, Abrams tanks that will arrive here in a year. And uh, it's a 31 tanks, which not with really updated armor, when we have 6,000 of those tanks sitting sitting in the desert. Uh, 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 in... Um, preserved so uh, why can't these two all these programs work at the same time so we do not lose legislatives in a bipartisan congress uh and we also provide what the gap to fill the gap between them with the land lease we what we have difficulty explaining to to people here is why did the united states congress voted for the land lease president signed it but hasn't worked. I mean, it was supposed to simplify things, but actually turned out to be that it complicated things. And politicians use it, for example, in here in, in uh, Ukraine, they're saying, oh, if Republicans will come, if Republicans will come, then all of the aid will stop, which is very strange because many Republicans are speaking out for more uh, aid yeah. to Ukraine. So. But uh, there is this propaganda that is just unstoppable. So we don't understand why can't all these programs work? Why can't they all these programs work together on parallel and land lease fills up whatever we don't provide? Yes. Yeah, I, I don't have a good answer for you, Yuri. I, I, theoretically, these, these programs could work in parallel. Um, but I would see the one, the one downfall of that would be 
uh, how Congress appropriates funds to support Lend-Lease. If all the funds are going into the uh, Presidential Drawdown Authority, uh, PDA, uh, if that if if under the current program we're spending forty billion dollars or allocating forty billion dollars, the question is how much are you going to allocate to lend lease? And I agree. What what the law does is it, it authorizes the the transfer of uh, equipment under so called lend lease program. I'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, the authority to do it is not the same as the money that to, uh, to allow it, if right. you will. Or correction, the authority to allow it is not the same as the funding to do it. So right. the question is, where is Congress going to put their money? Are they going to put it behind Lynn Lease? Or are they going to go with this other program that is much favored by them because they can put their congressional Christmas ornaments on there uh, to, to help out back home? So um, theoretically, and in an objective world, you could run both programs together. However, it has become a, a politically expedient to run it through the current process of presidential drawdown authority. Now, in regards to the processes that you spoke about during your previous uh, session on Lynn lease you know, streamlining the processes, that's actually happened. Uh, whether it's been reported out to Congress or not, uh, the Department of Defense and the Defense uh, Security Cooperation uh, Agency, DSCA, you're, you're very familiar with them. Uh, they have streamlined a lot of processes to include the State Department uh, process for releasing things that are covered by the International Trade and Arms Regulations, ITAR, uh, where it's gone from a, a year or more for approvals down to weeks or less uh, to approvals. So that process moves rather quickly. Uh, and it's happened outside of congressional reporting uh, I think the Lynn Lease Act actually coerced them to actually do this. Uh, I spoke to them a while back, asked them why they weren't moving faster, and they said, "Well, this is what we are doing," uh, and got a bit of an education on them on the, on the uh, process. So, so I think, so I think there are things that have happened that, in practical terms, the presidential drawdown authority processes um, have happened because they were coerced to happen under Lynn Lease and. Uh, Congress has found that it's easier and much more, I would say, advantageous to them politically to go with that authority rather than lend lease. Uh, but objectively, I do agree with the point that you could run potentially both programs at the same time. Well, but because Maria and I and all of us, we're sitting here and I hear outside and uh, I, I think it's um, – uh, anti-air Ukrainian is wor working very well. But again, uh, we're thinking that there is so much destruction and so many lives. And you, uh, I thank you, we all thank you from the bottom of our hearts because you, you know, one thing I didn't mention, you do take part in helping uh, Ukrainian wounded soldiers that we're bringing in to Ukraine to, to be uh, repaired and to get them prestigious and so on. Uh, thank you very much, sir. But there's so much of this going on here. There's uh, cities are being wiped out from the face of the earth. There's there, there are 10 million refugees, people that lost everything, lost their homes. There's so much suffering. And yet, why couldn't we provide... Um, Air cover, air, you know, anti anti uh, missile defense. Uh, it's it's very strange that we're just so you know, American aircraft carrier turns very slowly, but once it turns, uh, you know, you better watch out. But it seems to me like we're turning very very slowly in this sense. Maybe because I'm here, and maybe because I'm seeing it all with my own eyes, and uh, uh, it, it seems to me that some KGB thug is keeping us hostage and threatening us with the nuclear uh, weapons and so on. We just can't, I just feel like we can't, we can't let him get away with it. We let him get away with it for too long. May I add a little bit also? Um, when we are saying about uh, air coverage, it also draws us back to the Land Lease Act because uh, getting these type of aircrafts is also an additional burden on American taxpayers. Should it be provided by the land lease program, then the already 
decades ago produced aircrafts could be delivered to Ukraine and it would cover the air and of course the losses would be much less. Uh, the answer is yes and yes. Uh, yes on all points that you make, Maria. I, I don't disagree with any of that. Uh, the politics behind providing aircraft that are entirely rotten, as Yuri pointed out. So I I don't disagree with anything you said, and I, I do agree that they can and should be provided, regardless of the program, whether it's Lynn Lease or Presidential Drawdown Authority. So either one. And I would say the more a more uh, a quicker way of doing it because as you know, sir, and when we were in Poland, we transferred the F-16s and, and I know with your classmate, <laughs> it drove him crazy because it was so complicated and so long to, to transfer, you know, it's just, it's not just airplanes, training a pilot is probably the easiest thing. My, my nephew's a pilot yeah. and he can fly a chair if you do you know, anything that flies, he'll fly. It doesn't take him long. These guys are just so sharp. And, uh, but uh, why can't we provide UAVs that can take off right from here? And, and, and I mean, there are a lot of different ways we can go around it, but uh, uh, I think you were, uh, you were probably more comfortable in answering questions about special forces. No, that's about okay. mass. <laughs> about no, that's, how do you, how do you I, think the Russian forces are performing? Uh, what is your opinion of the Russian military? at this point well i i think i think they're underperforming uh i think there's a lot of people that, that are in uh that have drawn the same conclusion they've underperformed in almost every dimension that you can imagine um the land forces have proved incapable of, of uh, conducting uh ground operations in a modern era specifically uh, multi-axis attacks uh, uh, not only conducting the offensive, but sustaining it. So the Russians have not performed well uh, on a number of dimensions, specifically uh, the battalion tactical groups, which is their, uh, it was a very interested in, 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 interesting and, and very, I would say, innovative approach to uh, combined, arm, combined arms uh, maneuver and warfare. Uh, so they started out the, the war with a, a formation known as the Battalion Tactical Groups, uh, which had not only infantry and armor, but they had artillery, air defense, electronic warfare, uh, engineering assets, etc. So they these Battalion Tactical Groups had uh, uh, you know up to uh, 200 vehicles with them, and they were they were advancing on a narrow front and became became too much. Uh, for a single commander to command effectively command and control, particularly with the poor state of technology that the Russians had. So the Russians have abandoned their basic tactical formation of the battalion tactical group. Uh, they also that also took away their ability to mass artillery fires, which, as we know, is the major way that that Russia uh, fights this war is with artillery. Uh, to uh, destroy everything in front of it, and then they then they advance the infantry and armor. Um, so that's the first thing. Second thing is under their reorganization that's been going on for about ten years, they reduced the number of infantrymen and, and the ground troops uh, inside the vehicles, the uh, armor personnel carriers, the BT, uh, uh, BMPs and BTRs and NTOs. So they they reduced those numbers because. They wanted to apply those numbers to those people to have more vehicles in the formation. So they took, they had the same number of people, but they wanted to increase the number of battalion tactical groups. And what they did is they took the infantry out of the vehicles. So you have reports of Ukrainian uh, uh, forces destroying BMPs with just a driver and a, uh, uh, a commander in it. There's no dismounted troops in the back. Uh, because they don't have any dismounted troops when they get into a restricted terrain situation like they had when they were all backed up on the roads or when they're in an urban environment, they don't have those infantry to dismount and protect the armor or the other formations that are there. And as a result of that, they were getting chewed up in a restrictive terrain because they didn't have the infantry to go with it. So organizationally, 
they made uh, changes down at the tactical level that worked against their effectiveness, and it still is a problem today. What they did was they wasted the skilled leadership at the tactical level and the skilled uh, infantrymen and tankers, at the, uh, they wasted it in the previous scenario. Now they've reorganized and they've got a bunch of uh, reservists that have been called up that are poorly trained. And you've got uh, prisoners, you've got all that. They've got, they've got very low skill tactical troops, not only at the, at the individual level, but also at the small unit tactical leadership level. As a result of that, you have a decreasing effectiveness uh, among the Russian forces. Now, the way they're making up for it is twofold. One, uh, by massing artillery fires, and two, by mass assaults uh, or mass repetitive assaults. So their their tactical uh, uh, method now is exhausting Ukrainian defenses, meaning they just send in, I, I got a report uh, last week, uh, the Russians are attacking in column three times a day on the same route trying to do the same thing and we destroy them every time and there's some great uh there are some great pictures online now of of how the russians are being destroyed in the same place uh in the same way every time because they attack the same place in the same way every time so anyway so they've burned through their skilled leadership at the tactical level now they're dealing with inexperienced people and they have to be very simple in their approaches and as a result their casualties in proportion to Ukrainians is absolutely exponentially higher. It doesn't mean they're not being successful because they're throwing so many people at the problem. If they mobilize again or they bring to bear this other 300,000 people, uh, then I think we're in for a tactical problem. But uh, so that's that's where you're at tactically. There are a couple other things that I think are important on Russian performance. The first one is, is that, that the military leadership reflects the national leadership. And in Russia, you have an autocratic uh, leadership style. Uh, it emanates from Putin, and everybody does what Herr Putin has to, has to say. Um, in the military, they've reflected that in that they have a very autocratic way of doing business. This is your objective, and this is how you're going to do it. There's no room for innovation. There's no room for deviating from that. Uh, you can't, you can't uh, modify your plan. There are a lot of things you can't do. So as a result of that, they have no flexibility at the tactical level because it's, it's dictated from higher up. Additionally, uh, I think they have uh, the Russian strategic leadership, uh, specifically uh, uh, Herr Putin, and uh, his senior leaders uh, that work underneath him overestimated their abilities. One of the questions that you asked me early on uh, when we were working up to this session was, why did they attack? Well, because they thought they would win. It's a, it's a simple answer, quite frankly. You know, um, they thought they would win. They had a strategic misjudgment uh, of epic proportions where they overestimated their abilities to accomplish their strategic objectives in Ukraine. We can talk about that in a moment. But in the strategic art and science, where you identify your strategic end, and do you apply your, your means, your resources, and your ways, your methods, to get to those ends, you had an ends mismatch with the ends, or with the means, and the ways. Okay, so they, they overestimated their capabilities because their means were insufficient to achieve their, their ends strategically. And as a result of that, they've become bogged down. They can't go forward and they can't back out. They're stuck. They're strategically stuck right now. Right. So that's a huge problem. Okay, so and let, me just, let me just pause here uh, with my next, after my next point. And that is simply this. The, the longstanding veil of invincibility that Russia has enjoyed until February 24th in 2023, uh, 22, that veil has been pierced. It has been ripped to shreds by the Ukrainian military. 
Nobody's afraid of the Russian bear at the tactical level anymore because we know they're not particularly competent. So uh, that has raised a lot of internal security issues of the Russian hinterlands, east of the Urals in, in particular, uh, of the greater Russia uh, out into the east. So uh, if you're if you're Katerov, as an example, uh, from Chechnya, uh, you know that you have an opposition at home and that there are two battalions of uh, Chechnyans fighting on the side of the Ukrainians. Uh, you know that there's a Russian diaspora fighting in Ukraine for Ukraine against Russia. So you know it, that you have a larger security issue because this veil of national uh, invincibility that Russia has enjoyed up until this war has been stripped away. So I'll pause there for uh, your reflection. Yes, and it's, uh, it's also they know when, uh, which I particularly enjoy, when uh, a great American gen general uh, repass refers to us when he talks about Ukrainians. So it's a little Freudian there, but it really sure. sounds good, sir. <laughs> we get them every time. <laughs> and when Ukrainians get them every time, right, we get them. There we go. Okay. Uh, uh, so actually, you've answered my next question, which was how do you think the Ukrainians are performing, which was probably unexpected by all of us that they would do. Uh, but you answered that. that uh, the difference between we so have, Maria, please. Yes, we have uh, some uh, interesting news. Uh, well, troubling maybe in a way because I read yesterday that uh, France and Canada asked their citizens to leave Belarus. Uh, can you comment on that? Um, uh, advice that France and uh, Canada gave to their citizens who stay right now in Belarus. Why should they leave immediately Belarus? What is under uh, under that advice? So typically a, a nation will uh, issue a notice out of the embassy for its citizens to leave the country because they perceive a threat of some sort. Uh, so there, there are two parts to your question, Maria, uh, and it deals with the security situation in Belarus. Um, my understanding of what's going on in Belarus is that uh, the Russians that were mobilized in large part are being trained in Belarus. Belarus. Those forces are being moved around to the east. Uh, to be employed in the Donbas. Uh, there's some speculation in some capitals that uh, there will be a Russian attack from Belarus itself. I disagree with that assessment. I also disagree with those that would say that Belarus will also attack with Russia from Belarus into Ukraine. I don't think that would happen. I don't think, first off, the Belarusian forces are, are entirely horrible and not up to the task. They would be a burden to the Russians, uh, even as bad as the Russians uh, would be uh, themselves. Uh, the second part of that is the Belarusian people would not put up with an attack of their army onto Ukrainian soil. Uh, my read of the situation is, is that uh, Lukashenko fears his people uh, much more than he fears the Ukrainian army. Um, and if his people uh, saw that Lukashenko had agreed to attacking with his forces, with Belarusian forces, uh, into Ukraine, that the people would rise up against them. Uh, there's significant evidence that, that the Belarusian army would not uh, obey such orders to attack across the border into Ukraine. Um, and I think there's a significant resistance there uh, that is... Uh, is a an enhanced capability that has grown out of the last uh, series of elections that we, as we know, were entirely corrupt and stolen by Lukashenko with the help of uh, President uh, Vladimir Putin. So, uh, with all of that, that creates a a a high degree of uncertainty inside Belarus. 
at a time when we know that Russia is going to attack uh, uh, Ukraine with with uh, the forces that is mobilized over this past fall, uh, potentially from Belarus, or uh, use the Belarusian bases as a uh, as a place to launch attacks from uh, via air or uh, potentially over the ground. So that creates, I would say, public danger inside Belarus and that there could be political unrest to counter uh, those moves. And that would, that would catch the, the Canadians and the other uh, foreign nationals uh, in between, I would say, popular discontent, uh, which may be violent, and the security forces that will undoubtedly uh, violently repress them. So the idea is to get them out of the way in the event uh, that there's some type of uh, domestic, I would say, uh, I won't call it a revolution, but domestic uprising for sure. Thank you very much for your answer. Thank you very much, Noah. It's much more clear to me what's going on there. Also, I have a more specific question. Uh, you know probably better than anyone else. Uh, airborne Division, Air Assault, Screaming Brigade. Eagles is partially Brigade. stationed in Romania, next to the Ukrainian borders. What is the mission? She's pulling mission secrets is, uh, out of us. <laughs> She's pulling secrets out of you, sir. <laughs> yeah. I, have no, I, have no I, I believe. I believe. I believe it's a brigade there. It's a full brigade. Yeah. yeah. So they, they've got a four command post and a uh, brigade there. Uh, that's a, uh, I have no secrets worth the extraction, but. <laughs> but <laughs> Marine uh, in this, in this case, uh, yeah, their presence there, A, is not a secret, and B, uh, is not as sexy as we would like it to be, um, or as menacing as we would like it to be. So first off, um, it's regional stability and assurance to our uh very good regional ally, Romania. Uh, back in uh, the early aughts, uh, in the 2000s, uh, there was a gentleman that was in charge of US Army Europe, B.B. Uh, Bell, he was a four-star general. And he had the vision to say, look, uh, we're drawing down forces in, in Europe, but we need to set up infrastructure uh, and outposts uh, throughout Europe uh, that we can potentially fall in on in times of crisis or conflict. One of such places is MK Air Base uh, in uh, Eastern Romania, near the, uh, it's slightly west of the port of uh, Constanta. So the headquarters is going into MK Air Base and then you've got the actual operating forces, some of which are there, and then some are out dispersed in other places to include in Bulgaria. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a training bay, a very nice training base training grounds in uh, in Bulgaria, and then also out with the uh, Romanian army. The purpose is, the primary purpose is reassurance, uh, but with that on the U.S. side, it's reassurance to NATO allies, but with on the U.S. side, it gives us a forward, uh, forward capability in a case of uh, circumstances that spiral out of control or we need to rapidly surge forces forward. We've already got a brigade on the ground on the eastern flank of uh, NATO, uh, uh, positioned and well-trained and capable of moving forward if need be. So it serves both a NATO purpose and a U.S. Uh, contingency purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, um, okay. Because, well, we um, just, uh, just, uh, just to remind that we did have a missile go over Romanian uh, airspace into Ukraine. And we also had uh, two missiles hit Poland. You know, both of them are on NATO allies where they killed two men. So, and so far we're again, we're being very, uh, mm -hmm. very light on, uh, on Putin uh, in those actions. Go ahead, Maria, I'm sorry. Yes, that was a part of my question. Um, Russia all the time declares uh, that it is at war with NATO. In confirmation of its intentions, even missiles um, are launched into NATO's airspace. Um, 
what else needs to happen so that NATO does not remain silent behind the backs of Ukrainian soldiers? In the United States, do people realize at all, I mean, the Russian media, they are full of those threats directly um, to United States. Uh, they, um, all years, but now especially, um, do people realize that Russia declares to be fighting with NATO? Evidently, in Romania, two missiles um, went into the airspace of NATO. Where is the response? So, so first off, uh, let me let me separate the U.S. and NATO. Um, so NATO has, I think, has been full-throated and, and unequivocal in its support for Ukraine, uh, short of war. Uh, NATO has not found the conditions necessary to declare a war on Russia over Ukraine. Now, uh, I would also point out that according to U.S. media reporting, which we know is is uh, occasionally flawed, I'll say. I'll, I'll be generous in that, that regard. Uh, uh, Romania has, has, has stated that when, when Moldova declared that uh, missiles overflew its territory from Romania, Romania has said that that's not true. They've disavowed that. The Romanian government has. Um, I, I will accept it as truth uh, and just to move forward on the discussion here. Uh, let's say that's true. Uh, now, are we going to go to war over uh, missiles over flying territory, or are we going to go to war over uh, uh, bombardment of um, uh, uh, MK airfield or something like? So, on the scale of violence, a uh, missile overflight is is pretty low uh, compared to. Uh, other things that, that could potentially happen uh, and that Russia is capable of doing. Um, they're capable of acting asymmetrically, both in the gray zone and also overtly, uh, to, to go to war uh, with uh, NATO. So if Russia is truly at war with NATO, I don't see it doing any offensive operations against NATO on NATO sovereign territory. So the rhetoric is interesting, uh, but the rhetoric is for domestic uh, consumption as opposed to international consumption. Specifically, there, there are indications and warnings that go along with Russian mobilization towards uh, war with NATO. And there, are, there, will, there will be uh, signposts along the way where we say, okay, they're gearing up for war against NATO. Uh, maybe they attack uh, Narvik in, uh, or, or they mass on the Estonian border or even the Lithuanian border to press into uh, uh, the enclave there, uh, oh, okay. Kaliningrad. So there are, there are specific indications and warnings that would, that would truly indicate that Russia is mounting or is at war with NATO. Having said that, Russia knows that if it engages in a war, a proper war with NATO, that th that war will be over in a matter of days and weeks at the most extreme. Uh, because the capabilities that NATO would bring to bear are beyond anything that Russia could bear. Uh, they, could, they would not be able to, to sustain it. So what the rhetoric is, is, is to keep, the rhetoric is there in their, in their uh, local papers and in the uh, international press to keep their populace focused and engage. It is not there to draw NATO into the fight. They would love to have that because then they can galvanize their people because the people doubt whether or not there's actual NATO forces there. So anyway, that's a long way to say that I don't think uh, there's anything meaningful behind the Russian rhetoric that they're at war with, uh, with NATO. Uh, other than is for domestic political uh, purposes. Now, the U.S., on the other hand, uh, has to pay attention to what, what 
Russia says, because of the nuclear situation there. The U.S. has not only a national responsibility for nuclear deterrence and nuclear protection, but they also have a larger responsibility to their NATO partners. It would be unwise for, for the U.S. to do something, I would say, that is out of, maybe out of proportion uh, with the actual threat presented by Russia uh, and rapidly escalate into a nuclear war uh, without the Europeans uh, fully on board with this. And there's nothing to indicate that we're actually going towards a nuclear escalation. There's rhetoric in that way. There's foolish rhetoric. Uh, but the, the same-minded people in both Moscow and Washington see this with clear eyes and that, that they're separating the international and domestic rhetoric in Russia from facts on the ground. So it's not like one day uh, Russia wakes up and says, ah, okay, uh, Putin walks over and says, I'm going to hit the red button here, and we're going to launch you know, a nuclear attack on the United States. There's a lot of preparation that goes into that. Those preparations would be known. Okay, so uh, over the years, we've built up confidence in security building measures um, to where both sides understand where they're at in the nuclear escalation ladder. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and we're not we're not sufficiently high on a nuclear escalation scale. So the United States is not going to be, I would say, drawn into a nuclear conflict or a NATO or NATO drawn into a conflict with Russia over the rhetoric that they've expressed so far. It has to be much more, I would say, physical and violent for either the U.S. unilaterally or uh, U.S. multilaterally with partners outside of NATO or NATO as an alliance to go to war with Russia. Thank you, sir. Let, let me modify a little bit my question then. Yeah. The U.S. President, uh, Joe Biden, warned in February 2022 if Russia targets an American, American citizen in Ukraine, the U.S. will respond forcefully. That's I'm, I'm, I, I, this is uh, his direct words. By that time now, Brent Anthony Renault was an American journalist, documentary filmmaker and photojournalist. Renault was shot and killed by Russian soldiers in Irpin, Kiev, uh, Oblast, uh, Kiev district uh, of Ukraine while covering the 2022 Russian invasion of Ukraine. Then, Ukraine's International Legion has named the U.S. citizen killed during the combat of Eastern Ukraine. Timothy Griffin is believed to be the sixth American who has died in Ukraine since the Russian invasion in February. Where is the forceful response? We just uh, we also just had another American killed, a former Marine. I know there is no such thing as a former Marines, but a brother Marine got killed. Uh, he's a volunteer. He was actually helping elder people to move out of the harm's way. I think he was killed yesterday. Yeah. Okay, so uh, a couple of points. First off, uh, the death uh, of Ukrainian citizens and international citizens is, is not acceptable. It's not acceptable to me. It's not acceptable to a lot of people. Um, however, the manner in which they are killed uh, should be understood in that these people were doing what they wanted to do outside of U.S. government sanction. Um, when a soldier engages another soldier or another person in uh, the course of combat, nobody wears identification badges that can be seen at 300 yards saying, okay, I'm I'm a U.S. citizen. Don't shoot me. Um, you know things like that. So, so unfortunately, artillery does not discriminate nationalities, and that's the primary killer of both civilians and military inside Ukraine is artillery. Um, so it's indiscriminate violence, which the Geneva and Hague Conventions attempted to. Uh, restrict uh, to only that of necessity. 
What we see in play in Ukraine is Russian wanton uh, violence uh, visited upon civilians and military alike. There's no discrimination there, which is clearly a violation of international law and humanitarian law. So that that is extremely objectionable on multiple levels. Thank now, you, sir. Uh, yeah, but let me just finish off with this. Um, I'll give you a vignette. Uh, so I uh, I commanded forces that went to Iraq. Um, on my first tour of duty over there, uh, a gentleman that had worked for me before had reached retirement eligible status in, in the Army. And I talked to him. And I said, uh, I said, Rich, I, I thought you were going to retire. You know, where's your paperwork? He says, oh, I'll get it on your desk. And sure enough, his paperwork for retirement showed up on my desk. In the meantime, our deployment orders for Iraq showed up. And he came to my office. He said, hey, uh, where are my retirement papers? I said, right here in my inbox. Do you want me to sign them? He goes, he goes no, tear them up. I said, no, I'm not going to tear them up. I'll, he goes, he said, Hey, I'll, you can sign them when we get back from this deployment. I said, okay, fine. So I gave him his retirement papers back. And I said, don't tear them up because I want them back after the deployment. He said, okay, that's a deal. And his parting word to me was, I want to go on one more, I want to go on combat deployments with you because we had a very tight personal relationship. He was a non commissioned officer that I'd known for a number of years. I said, okay. I said, but Rich, if you go over there and you get hurt, I'm going to kill you. So <clears throat> the deployment happens. And sure enough, uh, unfortunately, he was killed. And I got to live with that every single day of my life. Okay. That's, some, that's a burden that I carry. Uh, that affects me. Um, fast forward another year, we're going back to Iraq. Uh, and the same thing, guy comes to me and says, hey, uh, I want you to hold off on my retirement paperwork uh, because I want to go to Iraq. I said, no, absolutely not. I'm signing your retirement paperwork. He says, is this because of Rich? And I said, yes, it is. And this is what he told me. And this is what comes to the, I'm, this is the point I'm trying to make. He goes, sir, he said, I can retire and go home. And then I could walk across the street and be hit by a car. That would be a waste. Me going to Iraq, fighting with my buddies and the people that I grew up with in the military. If I were to get killed, that's a sacrifice, but that's a price I'm willing to pay. That is not a waste. I died doing what I wanted to do. So those six Americans died knowing full well uh, the perils that they faced, but they died doing what they want to do. Okay? That is outside of U.S. sanction. But my heart goes out to them and their families. But I know that those those men died doing what they wanted to do. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And I hope my family will listen to this and appreciate. And I hope uh, uh, because I have a lot of struggle with my friends and family with this. But I think we appreciate what you just said, Marie and I, because I think that our listeners and you can appreciate this because we see death and destruction here every day. We see children getting killed, uh, uh, women, uh, older people freezing. Maria is, uh, you know, she sits there, but I know she's cold. I know that because I'm cold. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, there's no electricity. People are dying from stress. From uh, And the reason why we're saying land lease weapons the more weapons you're going to give ukrainians the less death is going to be here the more the the sooner they're going to defend themselves and uh we'll stop the just stop the killing just stop this you know this cold uh cult of death that this kgb thug sends down our way 
and this is why we're so eminent about it. This is why we're so emotional about it because we see it because this is very close to us. And how can we how can we abandon these people? How can we stand by and watch this going on? And this is why we're you know we're pressuring our government, we're pressuring our congressmen, we're pressuring everybody to do something about it. We can't stand here, World War II type of thing, watching Jews being burned, uh, Egyptians being killed, and so on and so on. This is just uh, not not an American way of uh, of being. This is not America that I loved and and I fought for and I swore to defend. And this is my next question to you, sir. Uh, President of Poland, uh, President Duda, just said to a couple of days ago, he said, if Ukrainians are not going to get weapons very soon, they have a chance of losing this. They have a chance of losing the war. And, uh, uh, you know, I'm a product of Soviet Reagan time. I remember like yesterday, that President Reagan called Soviet Union an evil empire. Mm -hmm. I wrote him a letter. I said, "I'm going to be. I'm going to join the United States Marine Corps. I'm going to. I'm, I, I know what you're saying, sir. I know what you're saying, Mr. President." <laughs> There's another story where he, where he did answer me. I was in high school then, and uh, uh, that was a strong leader, in my opinion. He was. This is when the Soviet Union collapsed. I took part, and I watched it all this. I lived through all this, and I'm thinking. Is, is Putin acting this way now because we have a weak leadership, because mm -hmm. European weak leadership, because in the United States we're all split up and fighting among each other? Why is he doing this now? Why, why can't we just stop him, stop him and show him strength? Because that's all I think this thug knows or understands. I don't think he understands negotiations or any kind of moral boundaries mm -hmm. i don't know this is my this is just my opinion it's not even the question sir i know it's everybody has their own <laughs> i'm just uh, so i'm just venting your your story your personal story just affected me very very yeah. much so yuri I, I i think what you described as your personal opinion is is a bit more uh of a hard truth and a hard reality out there um yeah you attach some emotion to it but but the facts on the ground bear out everything you said. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. I have to ask that question anyway. We need advice in that case. In that situation that we are right now, we need to activate maybe the land leads. Maybe we need to reinforce other programs. But the lack of uh, weapons is badly and the uh, words uh, that were pronounced by president of poland andrzej duda are really very troubling and i think we should uh, see them very seriously i think that uh, the united states were capable all uh, the all the time uh, all these 11 months almost a year now uh, to reinforce the ukrainian army more more effectively so that the war could maybe be won by now already but we are now still in a position of course ukraine is i must admit uh, practically in a uh, total dependence on the will of uh, uh, the white house and uh, maybe some Personal things matter also, I don't know. But the fact is that while this year we heard a lot of military uh, people from the US saying that the war could be won by Ukraine long ago if uh, United States would involve more, would give more weapons. We are not asking to uh, fight instead of us. We, don't, we are not saying that we need uh, soldiers from the United States, but we need much more weapons. Give us, please, advice. What should be done? What else can we do? Not in order not to lose the war, where it could be won already long ago. Okay. Uh, if you'll bear with me, I'll, I'll give you three things that I think the Ukraine military can do or or ukraine as a whole can do 
Uh, the first one is fixed logistics. I talked about that briefly. Uh, but they've got to mo modernize from a pull system, a demand system, to a push system, as I previously described. Um, that requires total asset visibility. So we have to know what all your equipment is, what the inventory is, because from that, we can estimate the number of repair parts and ammunition that, that will be consumed, et cetera. Okay. Uh, the log fast system now perfectly installed, that it's done. Uh, the uh, uh, there was an American delegation who visited Ukraine to reassure that it's done and it's done. Log fast the system to uh, check up all the logistics. Logistics is already installed and it's working in Ukraine. Maybe it's it will solve partly all of uh, the whole uh, delivery system uh, and it will be more transparent. I think that's what Ukrainians are already doing. So the system is installed. I, I, I disagree with the characterization that it's working. By the way, that's a NATO system uh, uh, that the nations get to uh, have visibility on. So I, I don't think it's working at the tactical level yet. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, I know for a fact that if I were to send 10 pieces of equipment to a specific unit in uh, Ukraine, that maybe three or five of those pieces of equipment will get there because somebody's gonna divert that equipment uh, to other units or it will go to a warehouse somewhere. Uh, I am not making any allegation of people uh, uh, selling it on the black market. I don't believe that's going on at all. Right, I, right. I think the equipment is being diverted from where it's intended to go to other places which corrupts the log fast system. If the log fast system says uh, a unit in Donbass, we'll just call it unit one, two, three, needs five uh, BMPs, we send those five and only two show up, you've corrupted the system because you've shorted them and the system will show that they have five because five were sent. And you've further compounded the error because there are three out there in units where they didn't belong to begin with. So, so there are there are elements of I would say uh, integrity from the sourcing of the of the uh, equipment through the provision of it to the user, where things get diverted for not nefarious purposes, for legitimate purposes, but that doesn't get where it goes. So there there are issues along those lines. Uh, that I know exists. And I know as recently as two weeks ago uh, from an assessment that I read. Okay, now, the second thing is, I'm sorry, Maria, let me let me pause there. I've got two more things that I think Ukraine can do, but let me pause there in case you want to come back to me with another point. Excuse me. Two more things. Yeah, I got two more things, but I wanted to pause there unless you wanted to take me to task for my explanation on the logistics side. I think uh, we should it analyze it was, it was clear. what you it was have clear. said it now, clear. and we, th we have to analyze your words. Uh, I'm not so precise now. I, I believe that Ukraine, in a situation of a total lack of equipment, of a total lack of mm. armament, sometimes needs to do something to keep alive to keep to keep moving to keep going on and sometimes yeah. maybe you can't do it just in the alphabetic uh, uh, row and sometimes you need to act as you say more um, um, flexible maybe that were uh, that's everything that is happening is happening out of lack general lack there it will be insufficient even if it would be uh, scheduled and everything on time and everywhere where it should be uh, where it should be still there would be an immense lack and who knows uh what's going to be next i mean in a, yeah. in a situation of total uh, insufficiency well yeah yeah so yeah i i agree with you uh, there are going to be excesses and shortages in logistics system throughout that's because there's never enough to go around and sometimes the bureaucracy becomes inefficient so i agree with you on the on that point in particular also i i'm quite impressed that you you knew about the log class system 
you know, as as an opera singer, that's not something that uh, you know that you should be familiar with. But by golly, you are. So that's quite impressive. So well done. She um, knows a lot of things. If you watch, her. I, I see that. Okay, she's she's to be. Uh, I have to pay very close attention. Sometimes, here. <laughs> sometimes, I, sometimes I'm like, how do you know that? I mean, I'm yeah. just like, I, yeah, I know. I mean, yeah, she's okay. a spy. She's typical. Yeah, perhaps she's a typical Definitely Russian not. spy from a from a, from an American Hollywood movie. I always yeah. suspect okay. her. All right, so I, I've got two other points where I think the Ukrainian army can improve. So, first off, I. I recognized in, in March, uh, certainly in April, uh, that the Ukrainian army that they have, that you have, uh, is probably not the Ukrainian army that's going to push Russia out of Ukraine. The Ukrainian army that you have is going to significantly degrade and defeat a large part of the, of the Russian army that's there now. And they've done a fantastic job at this. Uh, I have... I have no questions about the bravery or capability of the Ukrainian army in that regard. They have they have shown the world how to kill Russians, uh, and they do it quite well. Uh, however, there needs to be, there needed to be starting in in April a second army built with modern NATO equipment. Going to your point, Maria, uh, with NATO modern equipment to replace the things that we knew were going to wear out that were of the. Soviet and Russian era, like the T-62s, T-72s, T-80s, the Ukraine has, the BMPs, the Soviet era equipment. So we needed to start training those guys back in April to build this second army. The second army is being trained now to be introduced this spring uh, to help push Russia out. But we needed to have that a comprehensive training package along with equipping package back in the spring. But I still think it's possible. We're not out of time here. I, I do agree with uh, President Duda's point that if we don't get on the ball here, we, we risk, we collectively, the international community, uh, risks a defeat in Ukraine that will be unacceptable to any of us uh, that we know. Uh, but the second Ukrainian army needs to be built and it needs to have modern equipment or NATO standard equipment uh, that accepts NATO repair parts, NATO ammunition, that kind of business, uh, rather than you know trying to buy uh, old tank ammunition or artillery ammunition from Cambodia and Vietnam, you know, for for Pete's sake. Okay, so that's the second thing. The third thing uh, is already underway and is going quite well, I think. It has to continue to root out uh, top level corruption. Look. The strategic center of gravity for Ukraine is Western support. Okay. Now, under the Clausewitzian theory of, of, of war, every, every nation has a center of gravity from which it, it is the hub from which all its power emanates. And for Ukraine, the hub from which all power emanates is the Western support that's provided to Ukraine to sustain the conflict. All right, to make them successful. That, that support has to be sustained above all else. And this, this corruption that we've read about in the Western media, about you know, food prices or this, that, and the other, whatever that, whatever has happened out there, has a corrosive effect on domestic and political support at home. Absolutely. It puts that Western support at risk. Absolutely. So, I think I, I know that the actions that have been taken so far uh, have sought to preserve that Western support in the center of gravity that is that is supporting Ukraine. Uh, I just urge that 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 the government and the people remain vigilant along those lines and continue to take action uh, the way they've done so far. So let me pause there for additional topics. I think that uh, the Ukrainian government is working very tough on that subject, and uh, we're doing good, not happy we're doing good People progress. Are not happy here. They're uh, not stupid. Yes, but just in order to, we have you know the lack of time and lack of uh, weaponry. That's the um, that's something that is 
urging us. Well, right. Uh, well, the all Russians... these strategic ways to, to, of course, you are completely right. I agree uh, with every word about that. We have to work uh, on all of these subjects. The point is that we don't have so much time. And all of these uh, kind of uh, changements, they do need time. Um, so uh, probably... Um, Maybe in some also in some personal ways, I think that you're helping very, very much, uh, not only by um, uh, openly said and sometimes even evident um, efforts that you do, but also by um, being so involved and so warm hearted toward Ukraine. And thank you for that. And I. I, I guess I can say, but I guess that you do much more than even you say in order to help Ukraine. And please don't stop your efforts. We do need very much your help. In one day, we will take you all around Ukraine and you will see this beautiful country and beautiful people and very, very brave souls that fight hard. Sir, they fight hard with very little that they have. <clears throat> and I think that... Uh, the Russians realized that eventually, and hopefully sooner than later, the differences between the White House and the Congress and, uh, and uh, Europe and the United States will come to an end, and that dam is going to break loose, and we're going to flood Ukraine with everything we have, and they're going to be beaten. So it's just a race against time, and Russians know it, and that's why they're mobilizing, that's why they're throwing, you know, uh, Father uh, me at, at, at the front, just uh, as uh, Stalin said, sometimes quantity will replace quality, and yeah. <clears throat> this is this is their old style carpet bombing and just destroying everything on their way as barbarians. But you know we're dealing with a terrorist state. We're dealing with a terrorist uh, KGB uh, thugs. Uh, they, they, they have no morals, they have no standards, they, they, they're just absolutely, we can't live with them on the same, and share the same planet uh, any longer, something has to change. And uh, sir, I can't express how proud I am to have, uh, to serve with you for 30 years in, in our greatest military in the world, and uh, I appreciate your service. I also appreciate your help for Ukraine, for the wounded soldiers. Hopefully, I'm going to be coming home soon, bringing some more. And uh, you owe me your challenge coin. Okay. All right. It's a deal. All right. So uh, I, I look forward to coming back to Ukraine someday. Uh, I I was there in, in March. Uh, it did go over so well. Or actually, April, I did get back. Uh, it caused a bit of a stir, and I got... I would say pressured not to do that again. But uh, I've, I've been teaching there from uh, 2016 onward. And I left there January. Uh, uh, I left there about January 22nd of this past year. Uh, so it's been over a year since I've been there. But I look forward to coming back um, and doing whatever I can to to be of assistance. Thank you, sir. And you know, we, and we thank you. We thank you for staying on the right side of history. We all have to, you know, take those risks and criticism in some of our actions. But in our careers, if we didn't take risks and we didn't uh, take criticism, we wouldn't have been doing what we did for so many years. Yeah, tracker. I thank you very much, sir. God bless. Maria, it's entirely nice to meet you. Uh, I look forward to any other engagements you guys were interested in. Yuri, stay in touch, my friend. Yes, sir. I dream about inviting you to a opera concert, um, <laughs> maybe in Ukraine. Or maybe my Ukrainian will be uh, sufficient by then. Uh, right now, it's quite horrible. Duzhi Pohano. Duzhi Pohano. We move Still towards bad. our common Ukrainian victory. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Go Popojena. Go Bachina. До побачення. Разом, а, тоді для наших глядачів разом до перемоги і слава Україні. Героям слава. Героям слава. Yeah. <laughs> Very good, sir. All right, take care. Bye-bye.